Oh man, it's been a while. Winter just makes it not a whole lot of fun to be out in the woods looking at birds and wildlife. But after this long, cold win- yeah, actually, hold on. You know what? The winter has not been long and cold. Look at this. This is the coldest day it's been in like months. It was like 80 degrees last week. Anyway, here's Wandering in the Woods 3. <laughs> So the idea of these videos, if you haven't seen the first ones, is that you guys come with me on my wanders. I wander through the woods and I talk about some plants and some animals, maybe some bushcraft stuff. We just have a good old time here. most professional wildlife photography. This plant right here is called teasel. The entire surface of the stock is completely covered in these mean spikes. The flower heads also covered in spikes, even to the point where the leaves have an entire spine full of spikes. Not a nice plant, but useful to the survivor if used correctly. Teasel has a soft, pithy core and I've heard it's good for making hand drill fires. I've never tried this particular material, but it's very similar to cattail, which I have tried. On a side note, teasel has been known to be used in the treatment of Lyme disease. If you're at home, Lyme disease probably isn't such a big deal, but out in the woods, Lyme disease can, it'll mess you up. It doesn't kill the disease, but it does bring it out into the bloodstream where it, the body's natural mechanisms can deal with it. For a much more extensive, explanation on this, I'll put a link to a video in the description. Long and short of it, it's probably not going to work, but if it's your only option besides dying of Lyme disease, then go ahead and try. Teasel starts out its life and its first year as this small basal rosette of leaves. They're not quite as spiky as the adults are yet, they're just little babies at the moment. But in its second year of life, it'll shoot up a long stalk with an egg-shaped flower head, which can often be seen for a few seasons afterwards. This, for example, is last year's teasel stock, while this one is probably from two or three years ago. Apart from its uses as a tinder or a hand drill, teasel also has a hollow stock, which means it can be used as a blow tube. If you've never used a blow tube, it's an extremely handy tool in fire making and allows you to put a lot of oxygen exactly where you need it. Here we have something that's pretty much standard among every bank of every lake and river in Colorado, but these are cattails. But more specifically, these are narrowleaf cattails, or typha and gustifolia. They're the little babies of the cattail family. As you can see, they only grow to about knee or hip high. They're edible and useful in the same ways that regular cattails are. They're obviously just a lot smaller. Here we have an old stock of mullen. Mullen is a plant I've talked about before, but it's worth bringing up again. A very useful plant throughout the year as you can eat multiple parts throughout the spring and summer. And in the winter, you have the resource of this long, fairly strong stock for hand drill fires and other uses. Also, as I believe I mentioned before, you can smoke the leaves to clear out lung infections dubious practices in my opinion, but I do think I know a man who would try it out. That's like a hundred foot drop. And here we find another resource in the old dried out husks of milkweed. Milkweed is a useful plant in the summer, and I'll talk more about its other uses in a later video when we have a live specimen. But for now, I'd like to show you the winter and late fall use of milkweed. As you can see, by cracking the stalk, I can release all of these fibers and those fibers make a very good and strong cordage. It's very similar to stinging nettle, but here in Colorado there is no stinging nettle, so this is the best we got to work with. These fibers are fairly strong on their own, but they get exceptionally strong when woven into a good piece of reverse wrapped cordage. And it's one of the few plants in Colorado that can be made into a really good cordage. So it's a good one to know year round. If you don't focus on something other than those sticks, I'm a, I'm a lose it, man. 
And here we have the big brother of the cattail family, Typha latifolia, or common cattail, broadleaf cattail, whatever you want to call it. This is the most standard one people think of when they say cattail. It stands about six feet tall and it has a large flower head on top. I'm not going to bore you with talk of what it's useful for, I've gone over that in another video. And it's not that interesting when I can't actually show you the edible part, so we're going to come back to this in a later episode. One thing I don't think I have talked about, however, is the seed uses and in insulation. These seeds are extremely fluffy and they'll act like down, so if you're extremely cold in a survival scenario, try packing your clothing full of cattail seeds. I mean, good luck trying to get them back off your clothes once you're back in civilization, but if you're in a survival scenario, I don't think that's your biggest concern anyway. Look at that cattail head. I can't tell if that's multiple grown together or if that one just split off in that way. I would go so far as to say that that is mildly interesting. So here we come across our first edible of the day. This is pennycress, or at least it's very early stages. It's one of the first few to come up and it's identified by these lobed, sometimes toothy leaves. I'll show you an example of that. The flowers are tiny and white and have four petals. They grow in a dense cluster, though you can see most of them have not opened at this point. Here's a better example of those slightly toothed leaves I was talking about. The young leaves have a pretty pleasant taste, something like cabbage, but a little sweeter. Let me tell you, man, laying on the ground to get these shots, especially when it just snowed last night, it's not. Here we have that field pennycrest in its later stages. As you can see, it's shot up that stalk and the flowers have opened up. The leaves are flat and have a large seed in the middle. They can range from the size of a pinhead all the way up to the size of a quarter, and they have an extremely strong mustard-like taste. Listen, man, do you mind if I get past you? Because I kind of got to go that way. No? You're going to make me go around through all these spiky plants, aren't you? I should have shown him who's boss. And a few feet away from our first wild edible, we find the first thing that will kill you in early spring. This is poison hemlock, most likely. It's a member of the carrot family, and it's one of the first plants to come up in early spring. The tops do look exactly like regular carrot tops and if you pull up the root, it does look a lot like a carrot. So it's not exactly surprising that this plant accounts for a lot of poisonings. It can easily be identified by its bright green color and toothed leaves. You can see we're starting to get a little bit of color on the stalk. Later in the summer, that will mature into these bright red splotches, and it'll eventually send up a long, thin shoot that's topped with a cluster of white flowers. That white cluster of flowers is common through pretty much every species in the carrot family, so, uh, in my opinion, it's better to just stay away. The costs of misidentification greatly outweigh the benefits of positive identification. Here's another example of poison hemlock. And as you can see, this stuff is everywhere, all along this path. Any of you who are here for Wandering in the Woods too definitely recognize this as black birch. One of my personal favorite trees. All the bark is extremely flammable and useful in all the same ways that regular birch bark is. Plus, the wood is fairly hard and I'd really like it for carving. Check that out. That's actually kind of cool. Hey, could you get... Could, could, hey, could, could you, could... Mm. Quite no. As I was saying, while I'm still being rudely interrupted, that's that's kind of neat how that fell. The rest of the tree just sort of fell out from under it. Here's another pretty cool spot where this massive uh, cottonwood has just fallen. And if you remember back to the first wandering in the woods, I was just a tiny little bit obsessed with finding treasure underneath these fallen trees. However, it looks like we're still striking out on that front, so uh, that's that's unfortunate. Some squirrel tracks there. I don't know, what do you guys think? Should I jump with the camera and the tripod? 
I mean, obviously the answer is yes. I found some yucca, which if I haven't talked about yucca before, the yucca root is full of saponins, which means if you soak it in water and chop it up really fine, it'll produce some thick soapy suds, which can be used for cleaning. Pretty handy if you're out in the woods with no other means to clean yourself. It's harder to find with the milkweed, but does make much better cordage. And if we just take a look over there, my God, look at all that waterfowl. So real quick, I want to teach you guys something about tracking. So when you're going through woods like this, there's lots of prickly branches and things that will catch on clothing, so you'll sometimes be able to find little bits of clothing stuck on branches, just like this. And there's another one there, so we can make a, a lateral line down this, um, actually they, they probably followed the path. Anyway, that was your first lesson in tracking, hope you enjoyed. Now is when we need to see some third person stuff. This is just such a cool area. You guys can see there's just all of these rocks sticking up out of the river. All right, here's three edibles in this tiny area. Let's bang them out one after another. First one, Shepherd's Purse. I mentioned it earlier, it's very similar to Field Pennycress in both taste and look. You can see the major difference in the leaves. Pennycress has round leaves, while Shepherd's Purse has tiny heart-shaped leaves, but the arrangement of the plant and the flowers on top are extremely similar. Another main difference between the two, with Pennycress, the best parts of the plant are the leaves and the seeds. While with Shepherd's Purse, you can eat the entire plant. Stems, leaves, flowers, and root. Moving on, this is Mallow. Mallow is a great plant to know. You can see it all the way from early spring into late fall. And the tiny seeds, commonly known as cheese wheels, are also edible. Those cheese wheels, let me tell you guys, those can be a pretty good trailside snack. They have a lot more substance than the leaves do, and they just generally taste better as well. Fun thing about mallow, you can soak the leaves in water and make a thick gel. And while this can be used to make a primitive version of marshmallows, it can also be used as a skin moisturizer and conditioner for hair. So, uh, I, w um, wait, hold up. Are we... This is a manly show, right? It's just that, like, the YouTube comment section, it, it's not a nice place. And I don't, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'm putting forth enough masculinity when I'm talking about making conditioner out of plants. All right, third one in the small area. We have dandelions. We've talked about dandelions before, but they're always worth mentioning again. Did you know? Dandelion's official name is Taraxicum officinale. Officinale meaning official, and Taraxicum meaning remedy. So, Taraxicum officinale, official remedy. Get it? Cool. This comes from the dandelion's plethora of medicinal uses. They contain a ton of different vitamins and minerals, including some very notable ones like iron and vitamin C. The leaves of dandelion are heavily toothed, and they look extremely similar to shepherd's purse. Though, in my opinion, shepherd's purse leaves do taste significantly sweeter. Well, hasn't today been fun? We've been a little light on edible plants. I think I've missed my mark by a couple weeks. Come out here at the end of April, and it is going to be an absolute madhouse of edible plants. Anyhow, I'm going to let my past self talk to you about some late summer and early fall edibles that, let me tell you guys, these are some of my favorites. So, pay attention. Here's a plant that's rather common up at altitude and you've probably stepped on during your travels. But if you take a closer look, under the red stained oval leaves, you'll find one of nature's most closely guarded and tasty secrets. These are blueberries, but more specifically, these are bog blueberries. The plants only grow to about 6 inches tall, and the berries themselves are barely the size of airsoft pellets. So it can take quite a bit of gathering to make even a mouthful. But let me tell you guys, it's definitely worth it. 
You do not know joy until you've made some pancakes out in the woods and added in some freshly picked blueberries. This one here looks wholly uninviting and not like something you'd want to touch. This is prickly pear cactus, a very mean but very tasty plant if you know how to gather it properly. Both the pads and the fruit of prickly pear cactus are edible, though the fruit is much more desirable if you can get past the tiny hair-like spikes that are sure to be embedded in your fingers and bother you for a month afterwards. I found that the best way to remove them was to take your knife and scrape it horizontally across the surface of your skin. You can completely alleviate this problem to begin with, however, if you just take the time to use a lighter and burn off all the tiny hairs. Once those hairs are removed, the fruit is extremely sweet and tastes mildly like apple. The seeds are rather hard, so it's better to spit them out. They are nice to suck on for a little bit until you've removed all the flesh though. Overall, these are one of my favorite wild edibles to look for along the trail in late summer and early fall. Returning to an old wandering in the woods favorite, rose hips. As you see, these rose plants have mostly died off for the winter, but the rose hips are still easily accessible, and there are tons of them. This is why the rose hip is such a valuable resource, because you can find them all winter and they're a fantastic source of vitamin C when no others are available. And that's all I have for you today, so I'll allow my future self to wrap up the video while I return to the depths of the past. Have a good day, Archer out. Well now that was just a wholly enjoyable experience. A little light on edible plants maybe, but we did see some birds, climb some trees, search for some treasure, and hopefully you guys have learned something today because that's where I'm gonna end this episode. I hope you enjoyed, and that's all I have for you today guys. Archer out.